happy to introduce uh, Darcy Lear. She's, uh, she has a PhD from Ohio State University, and she has extensive experience teaching Spanish, especially Spanish for the professions. And, and uh, I, I was reading and we were talking of how she realized teaching this course uh, how much help students needed to know how to market their language skills and how important knowing a second language was for uh, for their careers and that's how she became a career coach and that's uh, she she went not went away but she's she's using more of her time uh, devoting more of her time uh, presenting in different universities I'll give you an example she was at CCNJ Arcadia University Brown University and she offers these work workshops to help students like you market the language skills or think if it would be convenient for them to continue with a language study. Uh, so with, without uh, further introductions, uh, it's my pleasure to leave you with da Darcy Lear. Thank you. And I, have, I already have you a have mic it. here, yeah, so we're recording. So as she said, my name is Darcy Lear and I'm a career coach. In these workshops, I train foreign language students to highlight their linguistic and culture skills in job search documents like resumes and cover letters, in interview preparation, and in professional school applications to go to grad school, medical school, business school. And I do that so that language students are standout candidates in really competitive job markets that we face now. So today, for you guys who mostly are not already minoring or majoring in languages, correct? The first question we want to ask how can studying a foreign language help you get the job you want when you graduate? And what I see is that with students who have pre-professional majors, like engineering, any kind of pre-medical profession, any kind of pre-law, business or econ, those students say, there's jobs out there in my field. It's not like I'm just graduating with a humanities degree and trying to find a professional job. But what I want to talk to you about today is, what if you layer language studies onto that pre-professional major? What kinds of job skills does that give you? And right off the top, we know it gives you more opportunities, more professional opportunities, a bigger professional network, and a faster path to promotion. So let's look at some examples of all three of those. More career opportunities. Think of all the job ads you read that say, ability to speak this language is a plus. Must be able to communicate with a diverse student population. There is, I mean, a diverse uh, patient population. There's not a hospital or clinic in the country that doesn't have that as a requirement. And in fact, there's not a medical school application that doesn't have an essay about your ability to work with diverse patient populations. Engineering. I had a client who majored in engineering and in German. So when he studied abroad in Germany, he got to do an internship at an engineering firm in Germany. So he's there at headquarters schmoozing with upper management ownership. When he comes back here, there's branches of that company in the U.S. If he goes to work there, he's so far ahead of his peers other U.S. young graduates who didn't major in German, who don't even know they're working at a German company sometimes. You just think it's another U.S.-based company, right? And that guy, he's already got a bigger professional network than his peers because he's already been to Germany and networked with upper management, maybe even ownership in Germany, right? So we see that it is more opportunities and with those opportunities come bigger professional networks. I had another networking example. I had a medical Spanish student who got a summer internship with the CDC before he had even applied to medical school. And that summer they were doing a summit on preventing communicable diseases at the border. It was a public health summit and this guy took was able to be the official note taker in breakout sessions in Spanish. He was able to network with the public health officials from the border states in Mexico. 
He was also able to network with the English-speaking American officials from the CDC here in the U.S. So in short, he could do everything at that summit. And all the monolingual Spanish speakers from Mexico could only network with other Mexicans. And all the monolingual English speakers from the CDC could only network with English speakers or maybe with interpreters involved. They could communicate. But there's that networking opportunity set that guy so far ahead of his peers before he even applied to medical school. And those things, those more opportunities and those bigger professional networks will put you on a faster path to promotion. If you're already networked with more people across more language groups, across the higher ups in the company, you'll be ahead. The other thing to consider here is purely language, right? Just speaking the language. And if we use Spanish in the US as the example, again, people with their pre-professional majors in the, the English language here in the US think, well, I'm going to work in the US. You, uh, presumably, you're aware of how globalized every industry is now. It's impossible to work isolated in any country. But if I work in the US and I study Spanish and I can speak it really well, what's that going to give me? Maybe I'll communicate with some low-level employees. Is that true? I mean, that's pretty much what most people think in our sort of m monolingual American mindset. Mo increasingly, across industries, because of globalization, you can use Spanish in the US that in the job, in the American company that you got with your English language resume and your English language CV and your mostly English language interview, you can use Spanish to talk to your colleagues, your clients, your vendors, your upper management, your owners. Another example like my engineering German client. Ba there's a bank in Spain. So if you're interested in banking, finance, business, econ, Banco Santander. Banco Santander has branches here, like in Rhode Island, and I think they call it Santander, don't they? <laughs> or something like that. But it's this huge Spanish bank. So if you went to study abroad in Spain, you could maybe visit their campus, and they've modeled their campus on Microsoft's campus here in the US. But the big secret about Banco Santander is that they also own a lot of American banks that you wouldn't think were Spanish banks. So you walk into your interview at SunTrust Bank, are you the one who just assumes you're working for this sort of narrow American bank? Are you the one who's already met upper management over in that Banco Santander campus outside of Madrid? And just knowing that, just doing your homework and doing the research and knowing that when I pair these things together, my business and finance studies, my Spanish studies, my study abroad, the research I'm doing on who really runs this, these companies that I want to eventually work for in banking and finance, and how much can language help with that? And we'll talk about some other examples of industries and companies here in the US that you're getting with your English language job search where you can use these linguistic and cultural skills. But before we move any further with that, I want to go to this next question that was up when you came in. What do employers want in new hires? that studying languages can give you. And the reason I want this up right away is because what do employers want is the question you should ask yourself over and over and over again. When you're writing your resume, what does the employer want? What do they need that you have? Right? What's their pain in the business the business school teaches you? What's their pain and how do you relieve that pain? When you're writing your cover letter, what do they want and how can you write your cover letter to be about them first? You are looking for a candidate who can do X, Y, Z, and I did that. I look at cover letters and I see the, I go down, what's the first word of every paragraph? It's usually I, me, my. It's not about you, it's about the employers, right? So we always have to get out in front, outside of our own heads, which again, languages and cultures are really good for helping you do that, and say, what do employers want? Well, there's various organizations that are constantly surveying employers and asking them specifically, what do you want in new hires who are recent college grads? So these are people who don't have that three to five years work experience in 
the professional field. And that's in so many job ads, right? Must have three to five years experience. But when you say to employers, listen, these are recent grads. They don't have three to five years work experience. What do you want in those new hires? And over and over and over, they say written and verbal communication skills. Again, if you're doing that in a second language, Spanish, French, German, you're, you're really acquiring the kinds of skills they want. Analysis, organization, problem solving, decision making. That's what you do all through your language classes when you get called on. That's always a problem. And you're always thinking fast and making quick decisions to solve it. Right? And we'll talk through some examples of that. In addition to these, they say things like flexibility, leadership, teamwork, ability to behave in culturally appropriate ways in a variety of contexts, right? That's what studying languages is all about. Cultures, intercultural competence, transcultural competence, we'll talk about those things. There's a couple problems here, though. And they all stem from a failure to connect the dots, a failure to read between the lines. And again, what do employers need? You have to know what they need and know how to tell them that you have it. You can't just stick a resume in front of them that lists a bunch of stuff. You can't say, I'm a self-starting leader who works great in teams, right? Anybody can say that. How do you prove that? How do you give me a story from your language class and tie it to what they need to prove, to illustrate that you're that self-starting team player or whatever, right? So what you have to do over and over and over and over for employers is connect the dots with real specific examples, many of which you can get from your language studies. What do most people do? I'm just going to go to the um, first thing most people prepare for their job search, the resume. Most recent grads show up with a resume something like this. There's a skills section. Where do people usually put that? Very bottom of the, of the one-page resume, like a PS afterthought, right? And then they just list a bunch of stuff. Don't list a bunch of stuff. Show, illustrate, prove that you, well, like, what did you code using that coding language, right? Name the things you coded. Put them somewhere else, higher up in your resume. Microsoft Office, you're not getting a four-year degree if you can't word process in Microsoft Word. But if you know how to use those nuanced, like, tables and manual templates that Word has, and you did an internship where you created an instruction manual and an employee manual, that should be in your work experience or professional experience and saying that you use Microsoft Word in that way. And then language, this tells me like almost nothing about your language. You know, can you just say, hola, como estas? Can you really fluently communicate? How have you used it? Has any of that been in a professional context? So. This is a bad job of communicating, crossing that bridge between the skills you're developing in your language classes. Yes, 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 you're developing them, but you've got to build the bridge over to, to the employer's side and show them what you can do and how it serves them. So here's a better example. Not perfect, but better. And I was thrilled when someone gave this to me with this heading on the resume, it's not work, but it's not education. It shows professional experience, and you usually coming straight out of college need community service and leadership, professional experience. It's not paid work, but it is in a professional context. Volunteerism and causes. Some people put a section on whatever you can put two or three separate entries under. You don't want a whole section with only one entry. And here is how this job candidate used her Spanish. She names the organization where she volunteered. She gives herself this title. The organization didn't call her a field volunteer. The instructors in the community service learning course didn't give her the name field volunteer, but she wanted employers to know, I was out in the field using my Spanish. I didn't volunteer, you know, typing up documents on my laptop in my dorm room, and I didn't go to their office and stuff envelopes. I was out in the field doing what? walking around conducting surveys in Spanish. That tells me a lot. Again, 
you have to connect the dots. You have to tell them in your cover letter, tell them in your interview, all this stuff I'm about to say. You don't have room on your resume. But that tells me she's got great interpersonal skills. She'd probably be good to send on business trips because she's not going to be calling me with like, I don't know how to get from here to there, right? She's resourceful. She has probably low intermediate language skills because she can walk up to people, comfortably introduce herself, ask them to participate in a survey. This is, in this particular community, Spanish speakers were a vulnerable population. So, so I know she had really good interpersonal skills if she got a lot of people to answer the survey, which is one of the flaws. I don't know how many people she got to answer the survey. But then when she's doing the survey, once they agree to do it, that's a script. Someone's written it out for her already. So she hardly needs any language skills beyond reading and pronouncing correctly to do those surveys. So you have to connect all those dots, fill in all, read between the lines like I just did to, to tell the employers, what does this mean about your level of Spanish? What does this mean about these really important professional skills like resourcefulness and interpersonal skills? The thing that should be on this resume entry that's missing that she didn't know to put is quantifiable information. You want quantifiable information everywhere you can get it on your resume. And here is a missed opportunity. How many surveys did she do? Over what period of time? What was the percent return rate on those surveys? Just those three digits, they take up no room on a one-page resume, but they tell you so much about that candidate's qualifications. If it's a 75% return rate, that tells me she's really resourceful, she's got great interpersonal skills, she's a good independent worker, I can probably send her off to do almost anything anywhere. The 25% of people who rejected her, what does that tell me about her? Anybody? One out of four people who she asked to do the survey said, no way, wouldn't do it. How did she react? Exactly, she was resilient. She was resilient in the face of rejection. She came back from failure. She overcame her weaknesses. You recognize some of those scary job interview questions, right? Tell me about your weaknesses, and you can't say, oh, I'm too perfect. That's what people always say. I'm too perfect. I'm a perfectionist. You need a real story about overcoming failure, being resilient, a weakness. And you always say, here's this little tiny story that's really no big deal, but it was a mistake. It was a failure. Here's what I learned from it and did differently to ultimately have this amazing success, which is my 75% return rate. So from this one little line, she's got a paragraph of a cover letter if it's, if it's relevant. She's got great answers to some of those really tough interview questions about weaknesses and failure and those kinds of things. So that's my initial just overview of what happens when you layer a language onto your pre-professional studies. What does that give you? in the working world, right? It gives you more opportunities, a bigger network, a faster path for prom promotion, ability to communicate with stakeholders all over the organizations, right? And gives you lots of really rich content potentially for your resume. So now I want to work on workshopping with you guys specifically. I want you all to tell me how this plays out for you with your future careers and with your current majors and minors. And we're going to start actually just reviewing back over some of what I just said. So go, you'll go straight to page three. Show, don't tell. We already talked about that. Connecting the dots and making everything about who? About you? No. no. About, right, about the employers. And we'll work on that on, in when we're workshopping page four. Then, provide quantifiable information everywhere you can. That's here on your resume, right? How many, what, over what period of time? How many students did you tutor? How many little kids did you make lunch for? Use strong action verbs, speaking of making lunch for little kids. If you have your resume with you right now or your laptop with your resume on it, you can get it out and cross off every example of these weak verbs, helped, assisted with, supported, concerning, 
related to. Those are so vague, right? It makes it sound like you either didn't even know what you were supposed to be doing in that internship or job, or like you were really passive. You kind of just sort of waited in the corner for someone to assign you a duty, and you want to sound like you were proactive. So the people who say, have a nice entry about working in a preschool or volunteering in an elementary school, and then say, helped with all classroom-related activities. That's too vague. Tell me, how many kids, what ages, and what you actually did, right? If you put their winter coats on and off for them at recess time, I'd rather know that than just helped and like you don't even really know what you did. Or if you prepared and cleaned up snacks for 45 four-year-olds five days a week, right? You can use that for one of those great interview answers about dealing with difficult situations or something like that. Okay, so make sure you're, you're getting rid of those weak verbs and asking yourself, what did I actually do? Let me just say that. And of course, the bigger, better, stronger you can make those verbs and still be true, the better off you'll be. And then this last bullet point on page three is tough. Keep education to a minimum. That, when I see with recent grads with a one-page resume, sometimes they'll have education taking up the top half of a one-page resume. And it lists like every semester you made dean's list. And I know you're so proud, but you got to take that off. It'll list every little award or every little uh, event or organization you participated in. If you got professional experience in those organizations and events, that needs to be in a section called professional experience. But when you give someone more than three lines for education, they won't take you seriously as a professional because it looks like you're applying to be a student or that you can't get out of that sort of university bubble of thinking of yourself as a student. You've been a student for 18 out of 22 years at that point. So like I know, I'm asking you, I'm asking the impossible. Take those 18 years, make them two lines, and then fill the whole rest of the page with stuff you've maybe squeezed into the cracks. But that's what you have to do. And some of the stuff that you're filling the rest of that page with can come from your language courses, it can come from your internships, it can come from your service opportunities or your campus organizations. You just have to spell it out in professional terms for the people that you're sending it to. And one of the reasons I say keep education to a minimum is that with the eye tracking studies they've done with recruiters and hiring managers, six to 10 seconds is all they'll spend looking at a single resume, if you're lucky. And that's after your resume survived the robot, the ATS, it's called the Applicant Tracking System, that scans most documents at all medium and larger companies now. So it's scanning for keywords. You want like a word cloud for the robot, but then if the robot likes it, it goes to a human and they don't want a word cloud. So it has to be this perfect balance. So the human gets it, six to 10 seconds is how long they look. You don't want six to 10 seconds being looking at every semester you made Dean's List, right? It has to really pop right there at the top and one page, because nobody's even gonna turn the page. And if you go on a second page, a lot of times your good juicy stuff is there on the second page. Okay. So that's my general spiel on layering a language onto your pre-professional studies, getting your resume into shape just in general, no matter what you're studying. Now what I want you guys to do is really workshop connecting language studies to career aspirations. So that's on page four, and I walk you through a really walk you through coming up with, on your own, a really specific example. But it could also be general, so I'll give you two examples. So we know employers want soft skills. Those are those skills I listed, like communication, leadership, teamwork, problem solving, decision making. But what does that mean for you? What's the real example you can use? Okay. So sometimes you need to just come up with a broad example and that this doesn't walk you through that quite so much but I at a workshop like this someone said okay I've got a field that I'd like to work in cosmetics and I'm and I'm majoring in Hispanic studies how could I possibly use that right so I was like well, get on Google right now okay 
how much, how many dollars in consumer spending in the U.S. are controlled by Spanish-speaking households? That number is readily available. I had just heard it on the radio bef before I went to that session. It was four billion dollars or four something. It was this huge amount of consumer spending. Who controls most of the decisions about consumer spending in those Spanish-speaking households in the U.S.? Can you guess? Women, right? So there's your connection to Spanish. You're a Spanish major. Every cosmetics company you go to interview with, you say, I've done my homework. I know the amount of money. I know who's making the decisions. I know that language. I know those cultures. Do you want that market share? You should hire me, right? You made it about them. You put the dollar signs and the numbers and the demographic group in their eyes, and then you said, and I can do that for you. So that's one example that I want you to come up with for yourself, for your career aspirations, for your language interests. A more specific example, and that you'll see on this handout that I want you to work through now, where you're, you're naming a professional uh, field in which you'd like to work. And if you have a specific position at a specific company, even better. The more specific you can be, the better. And then pick something that employers in that field will want a new hire to do well. So, that can be any one of these soft skills that I listed. I'll put them back up. Communication, teamwork. So I had a, at a different workshop an engineering student who was not pleased that he had to take languages at all. Right? He was really disliked the language requirement on his campus. So I talked him through like some of these skills. Are there, are there engineering employers who want you to be able to work in a team? and make decisions and solve problems on the kind of scale that we're talking about in language classes. So we took those, those traits, problem solving, decision making, teamwork. And then I said, now what's the story you could tell in a cover letter paragraph or an interview, right? In my German 101 class, I had the experience of not wanting to be there, right? Not participating because I really hated, resented the language requirement. Participation was 25% of my grade. So I was effectively working out of a 75% in that class from day one. So I strategized what I should do about the participation grade. Planned ahead to volunteer to answer questions strategically in class. So I could decide when I got called on and not get cornered, right? But then as I was volunteering to answer more, I swarmed up and started to feel comfortable asking my classmates, like, how are we supposed to conjugate that verb, or what does that word mean, and, and being able to work in groups. And then I realized a lot of times the peop two people next to me wouldn't know the answer either, and I would raise my hand and ask the professor to explain it. And everyone in the class would be like, oh, yeah, thanks, right? I, didn't, I, was, I wasn't following that either. That happens a lot when you're scared to ask a question, but then it turns out nobody does. How does that little example from your German 101 class affect this dream job at an engineering company, right? Well, you have to be willing to be wrong. You have to be willing to say, I don't know. You have to turn to mentors, cultivate collaborative relationships, and get you know, flawless bridges built. Because if there's flaws in bridges, that kills people. It's not like if you can't conjugate a verb perfectly, right? So you can take. That example of making quick little decisions and solving a little problem in a language class, and then you connect the dots to tell the employer, here's how I'm going to use that in your engineering company to make sure I'm producing the best engineering products possible. Okay, let's get some examples from among you guys. I know I've talked to three or four people who were started. Does anybody want to volunteer and we can talk through it and give, get you more ideas. Yes, good, thank you. Okay, so, um, oh, where's the microphone? Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay, so it's a story from work. <laughs> oh, it's just helping the video camera? Okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, once I was at work and I was a cashier and I got a customer who was speaking to me in English and I couldn't understand his English. He had a really, like, a strong accent yeah and um, so it took me a while I kept asking questions in English but he 
wasn't understanding and I wasn't understanding what he was trying to let me know. And then he asked me if I spoke Arabic and I do. So through Arabic, we were able to communicate. So Good. So I love that example where at your job, your language skills allow you to communicate with one client, but now connect the dots for the employer. So that taught me that sometimes I have to step out of like, like my, what I think of like everybody knows English. I have to ask my um, customers if they speak another language, possibly we share one and then I could communicate better, which is good for the field I'm looking into, which is healthcare. Which, Health, oh, right. Yeah. So this example would translate to healthcare perfectly. But remember with the example I gave of the cosmetics industry, your employer doesn't really care so much if you sold that one guy a bag of food. Mm -hmm. But what do we know about that one guy whose English isn't that great? Who's he hanging out with when he leaves the store? Other people who also probably struggle to communicate with cashiers in English, right? And do you want that business, right? And that's what you need to tell employers, right? Not only can I communicate with the random person who walks in, I know how the social networks on the ground in that language community work here. And I know that word of mouth will spread fast if we hang a sign in the window that says, the hours that there, there's an Arabic speaker in the store or that there's always an Arabic speaker in the store. And I can bring you that business, right? Not just the one person, but that whole market, so to speak. That's a great example. And add cultures in there too, if you can. Not just I can speak language. Um, with banking and Spanish speaking cultures, I always tell people, right? You have to explain banking and FDIC backing in the US sometimes before people will want to use a bank over a cash checking service because sometimes in the home country, banks are nightmares that fail all the time. Not that the U.S. is a great example of that now, although, but you know what I mean, right? What do you know about a culture that you can deliver to the clients so they'll want to use this, the goods and services that your employer is offering? How about the nursing example? Did she leave? <laughs> Okay, I had a good nursing example um, with patients, right? She's saying she would be able to communicate one-on-one -on -one and not need this third-party intermediary. But that also, from her language courses, she'd learned about nonverbal communication and how you can successfully communicate sometimes with gestures, with eye contact, by just simply observing that person's, you know, are their hands trembling because they're afraid, right? You're more attuned to that. One more example. How about uh, law enforcement or can someone do that? I talk so. Yeah. We're getting him his mic. But talk loud because we don't hear the mic. Okay. Um, basically, I was struggling to figure out how I can apply what I want to do. I'm a criminal justice major. And one day I want to be a police officer, even be a SWAT in that division. And basically, I that what they want is to is to have a composed individual and also to be quick thinking and quick to act but as well as to be able to follow orders and how it can basically apply is that um when it comes to the language i some languages i know i have a basic knowledge of spanish but from me working as a server to help pay with school i also have a good cultural understanding of the spanish people like i feel like prof i feel like i'm really in a way, I'm very culturally, I know. I'm culturally sensitive, yeah. culturally aware. Exactly, I'm very culturally aware of mm -hmm. how they are. So right. while I'm able to provide those things for my major, I'm also be able to be um, understanding and composed as well. Right, exactly. So think fast, act fast, but don't prejudge, profile, and make a mistake, right? And you have this experience with a community from your restaurant work, which is a great example to tie it in, where you can use language and your cultural knowledge to be a better SWAT team member. Anybody else have an example that they want to share with us? I think a lot of you are getting ideas and getting good ideas, and you just have to push yourself to take that extra step, the connect the dots that I keep talking about, not just 
you start with that great story about one day this guy couldn't communicate, eventually we figured out we both have Arabic in common. And take it to the next level of like, so here's what this means for you, potential employer who needs to hire me because nobody else can bring in all that business, can, can get tap that cultural network, whatever, right? So whatever you have now, I know you all have an idea. Make sure you're pushing yourself to think now, how do I make it big to sell it to the employer that they need what I have and that probably no one else does? Any questions about that part of the workshop, of what we just did? You're getting ideas for how languages are important to your career, how you could represent it in your resumes, how you could represent it in a job interview question, what the importance is of having language and cultures knowledge to do your job here in the U.S. No questions about that piece of this? Okay. So what I want to, so that's sort of the big picture, right? What can layering languages on to your pre-professional studies do for you? How can you, I know you can, how can you connect your language studies to your career aspirations? Make sure you find the great detailed specific example and then push past that to generally this is what it, this is what it means for you, big picture employer. Now I want to sort of change gears and talk about what you can do in your language classes here on campus while you're in Spanish 101, French 202. How do, how do your numbers work? 110, 111, right? In your minor, major, or just language courses, how can you be developing the professional skills that employers want you to have? So networking, right? So important for first impressions and last impressions, which we'll talk about today if we have time, last impressions, right? But how can you make that networking part of the language courses you take? Well, here's the advantage. Language courses are small in size. Faculty usually get to know everyone's names, and you should get to know the names of all your classmates. You work a lot in pairs and groups, right? And that's more true of language courses than most other courses on most college campuses. So it's this perfect opportunity to deploy networking, especially if your professor is on board and making it part of the course and being explicit with everyone about how important it is to their career goals. Right. So if you do this, if you work on this in your language classes, it'll be second nature to you. You'll be calm and smooth with it when you go to high stakes contexts like career fairs, job interviews, um, networking events, right? You don't want to be the sheepish, awkward person who's like, oh, I don't really feel comfortable offering my hand to shake and making eye contact, right? Which is what most recent grads will be like if they haven't actively worked on it, right? In the US, we're not usually very smooth with that. Someone just left and did a good job of that. She called me over and offered her hand to shake, exactly what you should be doing. So in these small classes, what do you need to know to, for, the, for the keys to networking? Names, for sure. Find out names, remember names, use names. People are so impressed when you encounter them for the second or third time. When you remember their name, that sticks in a hiring manager's mind. Even if they're not aware of it, they like you better and they can't really pinpoint why. It's because you knew their name, maybe. In the target language that you're studying, in French, in Arabic, in Spanish, make sure you know how to say kind of smooth things like, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. My name's Darcy. What's your name again? Stephanie. Stephanie. Thank you. Right? So you should know how to say that and be comfortable saying it in English and in whatever the target language is that you're studying. Right? And practice all the time. So names. Find out names. Remember names. Use names. Body language. Warm, open body language, smile, right? I know faculty here, we've all had the student who's 15 weeks like this in class. <laughs> and then they're like, hey, I loved your class. Will you write a letter of recommendation for business school? <laughs> and you're like, who is this person, right? They just didn't know that they were giving off that really closed, cold body language. Like crossing your arms, which is what a lot of us do when we're nervous, makes you seem cold and closed and cut off. So you want to find something else to do with your hands, which is, can be a challenge if this is your instinct, right? 
So warm, open body language. So a smile, but again, a warm, natural smile. So no scowling, but no like nervous, creepy clown smiles either. And that can take practice. You offer your hand to shake and you give a medium firm handshake, right? You don't want to do really limp and you don't want to do vice grip. So you practice that while you're making eye contact. Figure out what your own ticks are and really work on controlling them in the low stakes environment of your language class, right? So for me, the tick is flailing hands. And if there's beverages at a networking event, I don't know if any of you were in the commons this morning, I poured coffee all over a table like five minutes after I got to campus. That's my body language tick, it's flailing hands. And, and I have to work on controlling them without crossing them. So maybe this, because you don't want to put them in your pockets or sit on them either. Younger people like you guys, the tick a lot of times is verbal. It's the ums and the uhs and those kinds of markers in your speech that you need to really practice getting past, right? So names, good body language, and then the third big key is be a good listener, right? People love to talk about themselves, so if you can get them talking about themselves, you're off the hook. You're off the hook in your language class where you'd probably rather listen than produce the language, and you're off the hook in the networking event where you're kind of nervous but you want to be active and participate. So ask people about their work. Ask people about that project they're working on and follow up. Listen to what they're saying and, and ask nuanced follow-up questions. So wait, so that means you're working with like high school aged boys or college aged boys, right? So they know you're paying attention and you are, seem really interested in them. And then that gives you something for the follow-up email later when you ask for maybe a one-on-one -on -one networking interview, um, informational interview, they call them. Right? So be a good listener and get people talking about themselves. Have something ready to say about yourself. So when people try that on you to get you talking, you want to have a quick you know, personal branding statement like mine is what I opened with. Right? In these workshops, I train language students to highlight their linguistic and cultural skills in job search documents so they're standout candidates in competitive job markets, right? Something like that. So we're going to try this, okay? We're going to just stand up where we are, but turn around. It's a little, little Catholic peace be with you kind of thing, right? Stand up. Start with the people next to you, right? Just in English. Stephanie, we already met. Can you introduce me to your classmate, or don't you even know each other? Oh, okay. Okay, you can sit back where you were, if you don't mind. And I need a couple, like two or three of you, to introduce me to somebody else here in the room who you just met. So, for example, I met Stephanie just now in my model. Stephanie, do you know Jason? Two behind you? Jason studies sound engineering here. And Stephanie, what do you study? I'm a bio major, pre-med. Pre-med. So you both have similar interests in what you could do with the language, even though you're in really different careers. OK. Who can do me one more introduction? Introduce me to someone else that you just met. Yeah, go ahead. What? Yeah, you. Oh, Who did you meet? Um, I met uh, Andrew here, and he is an accounting major, and that's pretty much all. <laughs> Good. OK, and so this is what you want to do when you're networking, though, is find the common ground. right? And you can go online and sort of the career websites will give you these networking questions to ask that sort of come across as pickup lines and bars if it's not organic. You want to do more. What's interesting to both of us? What's your major? I always go for where are you from because I've lived all over and I can usually find some commonality. Like I lived near there. My dad's from South Jersey. That's what I do when I'm here. But it makes a real organic connection as they say. One more introduction. Who did you meet? Two more. I met uh, Trevor here. He is a biology major. And I, we talked about how, you know, um, I definitely couldn't, you know, do something like that. So I respect him for being a biology major. He wants to do researching. I'm not sure what it was again. It was like a long word. They called him biology major. <laughs> Good. And what did you tell Trevor about you? Um, that I was a criminal justice major. 
Well, we have. I was looking for a federal judge. So you want to work at like FBI level criminal justice, and we're going to do one more. I actually also met Trevor, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that he's a sophomore. He's a bio major, and his fav he wants to be an ecologist, as um, the person said. And um, I actually found out that we have something in common that. He's taking a class now with a certain professor that I had, even though I'm a senior. So we connected over that a little bit. Right. And that will help you remember Trevor next time you just pass him on campus. Like, oh, that's the guy who had Professor Patnaik, Patnaik just like me. And maybe it'll help you to remember his name's Trevor. And you can say, hi, Trevor. <laughs> right? So, and that's why you go for trying to find those organic connections, because it helps your brain to make and retain those connections. And if not, I'm sorry I forgot your name, but we both had that class. I'm, what's your name? Nora. Nora. We met at that workshop, you would say. Okay. And I have had in my, in Spanish workshops, I will make students kind of do what you just did, stand up, but say in Spanish, I would like to introduce you to, I would like to introduce you all to Stephanie. Stephanie is a pre-med student here at William Patterson. And what you see, and what I'm trying to illustrate with what we just did today, is at first, people struggle. They're embarrassed. They're nervous. They're sheepish. They're awkward. They have to look at the screen where the expression is written in Spanish. They struggle to not use like the obvious cognate that's wrong. And by the time we've gone around the room, that last person to stand up is just like, les quiero presentar a Stephanie. Stephanie es de Nueva Jersey. Right? The, the practice is what makes perfect. And then you're like, that person, that last person's ready to go to a career fair or a networking event. You don't want to be the first person. You don't want to be who you were when I made you stand up just now because you were probably giving off all kinds of insecure, nervous vibes, right? But after I made you do it a couple times, you probably would have been okay, right? That's who you want to be, the smooth person. And if you're faculty members are in on it or faculty are here, make sure you're explicit with students. You don't want to be the weird professor who's like, who's known on campus for the one who makes everybody shake hands in class all the time, right? It has to be clear that like, this is, we're practicing with professional networking. This is a skill that gets you over an important learning curve here where the stakes are low, so that when you really care and the stakes are high, you're really comfortable with it and blowing all the competition out of the water because everyone else is just getting started with those skills. So that's one really important professional skill that you can actively build in your language classes. Here's another one. Presentations in any course, really, but in language courses, because that's what we're talking about today. Make every presentation practice for the job interview. So when you attend in-class presentations that your peers are giving, what do you hate about presentations? What do we all hate about presentations, other people's presentations? You don't have to pick mine apart, but. Them reading or staring right into their yes. note cards. Yes. Reading. Reading or staring into their note cards. Or even if the teacher says no note cards, but they might as well have a note card imprinted on their brain, right, in language classes especially. Yes, reading or reciting. What else? Speaking monotone. Yeah. Monotone, too soft don't want to be there, basically. What else? What puts you to sleep? When you don't seem interested in what they're presenting. Right. They don't seem interested in what they're presenting. They repeat stuff you already covered in class. Haven't you sat through some of those where everybody did it in class last week and you're not adding anything to it. You're just repeating it. Or in language classes, they look up all the fancy words in the dictionary to try to impress the professor. The audience, that can't, the, the, your classmates, can't even understand those fancy words. You have to know your audience, right? Um, what else? What about support for presentations? Yeah, like haven't you gone to a presentation where they ha the handout is a printout of the slides? You read it while you're waiting for it to start. Then it starts, and they read it out loud to you for 40 minutes. You're like, I already read all this. You could have emailed it to me at home, and I read it in my pajamas. I wouldn't have even had to come here today, right? So you don't want, you don't want to write it all down anywhere and read it out loud to people. Good. Any other 
annoying presentation things. Well, it's not annoying, but it's a better perk if it's more interactive with the audience itself rather than just reading off the slides and it being like a normal presentation, like the way you interacted with us and making us do the activities um, along with the presentation. Right. If you can make it interactive, but and again, you know your audience. So, um, like with students, I know my audience. I've taught 20 years in college. I know I can get you to get active, even if you start off not wanting to. If my audience is faculty, I don't even always try that. Sometimes they really won't warm up and go along with getting together in little groups and doing an activity, sometimes, on some campuses, I notice that. So knowing your audience is super important. Knowing your time limits, going over, right? and then you're robbing time from other people or you get cut off before you even get to finish what you were going to say. Right? So you need to practice and prepare and time yourself for most of these. And then the problem I see is, I say this, we all go around with all these things that are really annoying. But then when it comes time for you to give your presentation, you're probably going to default to a lot of this stuff we're all saying we don't like, we all agree we don't like it, because no one has taught you a better or different way to present, right? Like PowerPoint, I, it's kind of like the skills line on a resume. If we could just abolish PowerPoint, that way I would be pretty happy with that because it winds up usually harming more than helping most presentations that it's used in. So what should you do to make sure your presentation doesn't have these flaws and is better than all of the competition, so to speak? So first, Treat it like a job interview and ask yourself when you're doing that presentation, would I do this in a job interview? So note cards. Would you take note cards to a job interview? No, and you certainly wouldn't get the job if you showed up with note cards. So try to be as prepared and practiced and polished for every presentation you do in class as you would be for a job interview, right? No note cards. Prepare, polish, practice, time yourself. So you have this perfect balance of practiced and polished, but seeming spontaneous, right? And that's not easy to do because you truly have to internalize that content from practicing it so much, right? But that's the ideal. Hard in your language classes because you know, the stakes aren't that high and you don't really care that much. Like you said, that's a big problem with a lot of presentations. People don't seem to care about what they're presenting on. When you're in a job interview, <laughs> you care. You want that job, right? There's more at stake for you. So what can you do to make yourself care more about your presentations in your language classes? Try to connect the project, the assignment, the presentation in your language class to your pre-professional major. So if you're taking a literature class in what language do you study? German. German, right? Look for examples in that text on public health, communicable diseases, illness. That's all over most literature. Mental illness, if you want to do like German fairy tales and all the children killing and whatever, right? I mean, I'm, I'm jumping all over, and I know literary scholars. Sometimes it's, uh, it can mess up sort of the purity of literary scholarship. But look for the connections yourself, and then pitch that to your professor. Say, I'm pre-med, so I really want to do my project on this particular aspect of this German literature that we're studying, and you can find it. If you're a business or finance, maybe not accounting, you're accounting, right? But again, literature is full of examples of economic models, right? And um, wealth distribution and poverty and wealth examples, right? So you can, you can bring your knowledge of econ or business that your language professors don't have, right? tie it to the content of that course and give a, a presentation that you care about and can therefore be prepared and practiced and polished and spontaneous sounding. Everybody's learning something new because not even the professor knew that content, so it's not repeating content, right? So it's win-win for you because you get to push yourself forward in your pre-professional career. You get to do a topic you're interested in. And then the big bonus is, when you need that letter of recommendation 
for medical school from a non-science professor. You will need a letter of recommendation from a non-science professor if you're applying to medical school. People find that out too late and then they're like, ah, who can I ask? Usually your language teacher because that's the one professor on campus who probably knew your name, right? But you want to be ready to say when you ask for a letter of recommendation for any graduate or professional school. Okay, first of all, here's my full name, the name of the course I took with you and the semester I took it. Right there, you're saving that faculty member 20 minutes researching who the heck you are and how they know you because for every you, there's hundreds of other people they've taught in the two years since you took the class and now are applying to grad school. So your full demographic information. And then you say, in your class, I did the following projects and assignments. And then describe that literature presentation you did that tied in public health issues or illness issues or economic models or finance issues, right? And then connect the dots, fill in, read between the lines for the faculty member and say, those course projects, those presentations I did in your class are connected to my career goals because as a practicing physician, I want to. As a practicing accountant, I need to be able to. As a um, lawyer or police officer, I need to be able to, right? Then you've practically written the letter of recommendation for the faculty member. They can cut and paste the information you gave them to, honestly, what's probably a form letter otherwise. I definitely have a form letter. So-and-so was a student in my X class in X semester. In that class, we did. Great stuff, it sounds great, but it's generic to what every student in the class did. I, would, I need specific stuff and you can provide it to me. And those kinds of requests trigger your memory and you're like, oh, that's right, he did do that really great project. And then he told me about his CDC work and that summit on the border and I wrote a great letter of recommendation for that former student when he was trying to go to medical school and he had great experience so he got into multiple medical school programs, right? So that's one really important way that you can tie your own career goals to your language class to make the presentations a really good really interesting to you really interesting to your audience and good practice for the job interview where you have to do the same thing kind of take the different pieces put it together spell it out for the employer be practiced be prepared be ready have timed yourself so if you are going to use PowerPoint, the couple of rules about PowerPoint are two minutes per slide, at least two minutes per slide. So if you have a 15 minute presentation, how many slides should you use? Max, seven or eight. So if you show up with 50 slides, you better have an hour and a half presentation. And I know at professional conferences that I go to, that happens all the time. And those poor people get cut off slide 12 when they're still warming up and the good stuff's buried down in slide 35. So two minutes per slide. Try to have the slide set up with an assertive statement, right? Every presentation should be practiced for job interviews. It's not just job interviews, colon, list, 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 right? If, if I gave you a list, it's here as a checklist for you to take home and use later, right? So an assertive statement, visual support wherever you can, and then maybe a follow-up uh, assertion, question, fact. For business and accounting, you can put up charts and tables. For the medical professions, you, your images are these really rich radiographs, maybe. I mean, PowerPoint's excellent for that. It's not so much for what I do, so it's a little more of a stretch to get the visual support there on um, networking. But it's more of a stretch to get the visual support that makes sense in to my slides. But if you can't do it, don't do it. Don't just put silly clip art on there or don't use PowerPoint gratuitously, right? But that's the how to do it. We know we're bored when people read to us, but nobody tells us what else to do. And this works subtly if you're ever in a competition, business plan competition, job competition where PowerPoint's involved. People will like your PowerPoint better but they won't quite know why, right? Because they, they won't perceive the formula of assertive statement, visual support, right? It enhances your presentation, but you still have to be there to present. You're still the presenter, the focus is still on you, and you have the PowerPoint there to support and enhance what you're saying, maybe to be your outline, but it doesn't replace 
or repeat your presentation. Okay, and so those bullets I think are on your handout. What page am I on? Um, if you use PowerPoint, Prezi, or other visual support at the bottom of page five, you have those four bullet points on how to use PowerPoint. Okay, and then the last topic that we're talking about today that you can develop, again, in your language courses or any other course, is digital identity. And this is just important for young people, often because I work with college students who either don't have a digital identity, which is bad. I Google you and there's like some little thing from high school about, you know, your debate award. You need to be online. Or... You have stuff, but it's not professional stuff, right? It's, it's digital dirt, we call it. You have to clean it up. And the reason this is so important for you guys is because you are what we call digital natives. You were born at a time, most of you, when there was already an internet, there was already smartphones, there was already personal computers. Hiring managers, bosses, owners, like my age, that's, we were already adults when that stuff came around. Like I was in college when personal computers started to exist and the really rich kids on campus had one in their dorm rooms. You know, it was like incredible. Then the smartphone, I mean, so you guys probably actually were children when the smartphones first came out that do everything, right? So people like us, older people, hiring managers, recruiters who were in their late 30s, early 40s, early 50s, they're digital immigrants, right? And so if we think of this as immigrants versus natives, there's all these sort of misunderstandings that happen, right? So I'm a native speaker of English. If you're learning English and you say to me, can you explain how auxiliary verbs work? Who here can explain auxiliary verbs in English? Who's a native English speaker? Yeah. You're a native English speaker and can explain it. One person in a room of 50, right? We don't know. When we're natives, we don't know how things work. We don't have that inner working meta level ability to explain, right? Whereas someone who studied English as a second or foreign language, they know what an auxiliary verb is because they're studying it from that meta level, right? Same with the digital stuff. I'm like an old fogey who's not that comfortable with online stuff. So I want to hire you young people and you can, you can design a website for me, right? But like a lot of job candidates who are fresh out of college and trying to meet those sort of employer, what do employers want in recent grads, say no when employers ask that. Can you design websites for us? No, right? Because you've always just taken it for granted. It's like auxiliary verbs. You didn't think about how to do it because they're always right there and someone else is always doing it, right? So you need to be ready for that clash. When you're interviewing with a digital immigrant, an older person, you need to be ready for them to expect you to have lots of digital savvy, right? So social media, probably you're all using it. What is an employer going to want? Social media marketing. And you have to be ready to take it to that level and blend your business and marketing studies with what you just ought to already know how to do on Instagram and Snapchat, right? That's different to just be there socially and to be social media marketing, right? So I want to go to an example of what we have to do. Let me see. I don't know if I'm on the internet on this computer, right? But the starting point, let me go over to the podium PC and do that. Yeah, so now I am. The first thing you need to do is clean up your digital dirt, right? curate your digital identity, take control of it, right? And then sell yourself as a native who's taking things to the next level, right? So what's there? What has to be added? What has to be deleted? And start, you can start by Googling. Can I Google right here? Someone you know, um, a professional who you admire, a classmate on campus. Where's the top? Oh, over here. Here's where you mean? Oh, and it's Bing. Okay. Um, so we're Binging instead of Googling, right? Oh, okay. This is fine. Um, so what's there? What has to be deleted? What has to be added? Any unsavory pictures, get them off. Any 
um, scantily dressed or drinking drunk pictures, get them off. Ask your friends to get them off, right? Um, I, for a long time, if I Googled myself, the first hit was University of North Carolina, right? I had to get that off. I hadn't worked there for a year. I'm trying to get my digital identity established as career coach navigating career transitions. And if you went to the University of North Carolina website and navigated, you couldn't get to me anymore. There were no links. But it's the number one hit was still that page. So I had to call the webmaster and say, take that page down. Right? What has to be deleted? That had to be deleted. Yes, question. Does it, does it matter if, if there's some pictures from like 13 or 14 is like going around the internet? Like, like you have to have those. I don't think so. But employers increasingly say, and we're talking way above 50%, they Google candidates before they interview them and make decisions about them. So the fact that you were a child doesn't really affect you negatively, but unprofessional stuff that you've done since you turned 18 does negatively affect. Because those are really the only stupid picture I have. I have when I was really young, like a younger teenager. Yeah, and don't, I mean, unless you were doing something illegal, then it's important to get it off. You know, there's lots of gray area, but no, those probably don't matter at all. And there's stuff that you can't do anything about if your friends have those silly 13-year-old pictures up there, right? Or here's this footballer, Darcy Connor Lear, who was an Australian rules footballer. That just went up, and he has a Wikipedia page. He's my second hit on Bing. It's usually lower on Google. Right? Well, I can't take that down. What I could do is set up my own Wikipedia page and try to get it to get lots of hits so it's higher. But you need kind of a huge ego to start your own Wikipedia page. You know, there's like all kinds of gray area there. But what I do do is I try to make sure that my website for my career coaching is the first hit. Same with images. I can't control all the images that go up, but most of them look professional. Facebook, LinkedIn is good. You want the first page to be mostly good. Um, videos, I don't see. Twitter, see Twitter here is second page. Nobody's ever going to look on the second page. And then here's a textbook, an intro Spanish textbook that I'm on that should be way at the top. Of course, you want that to be at the top. So I need to, that's something I need to add is getting certain results onto my first page of hits, right? So what do you add, what do you take off, and then how are you going to curate that? How are you able to get certain results onto the first page, like Google or Bing or whatever? Yeah, I am not a search engine optimization specialist, but it's the number of hits, it's the number of times you have been searched for that. So for example, six and a half years at University of North Carolina meant that that web page of mine at North Carolina had been tens of thousands of times had gotten hit. So I wasn't going to be able to compete with this my first year out. So maybe getting some stuff down. What if I just make a LinkedIn page, but I'll probably have more hits on like, you know, Facebook and Twitter stuff now. So, like no. so you work on your LinkedIn page. So if you're going to start a LinkedIn page, which is great for your profession, build your resume there. Add photos. Add professional blog posts. Right. And, and keep linking to it. Get people to link to it. Write posts that are interesting to people. They'll be going to your LinkedIn page to read those blog posts that are there, and that'll make the link LinkedIn rise. You have to go there and use it a lot to get it to rise. You should all have a website. There's about a thousand different user-friendly platforms. WordPress is what I have my website on. There's a lot of other ones. You should go. Just set up a little one. It would take you two hours to get the basic tab set up, get some good images there that you're controlling. Start to put your professional identity there, right? What are links to interesting criminal justice blogs or issues? What are links to really important accounting resources? What are your thoughts on that if you want to put a blog there? And then when you go to job interviews and they say, can you set up websites for us, you young digital native? You say, yeah, here's one I did. It's my professional website. So I'm sorry I don't have more information specifically on search engine optimization because that is definitely not my field. But this is what we want you to do, right? What's there? What's missing? 
and how can you take control to clean up your digital dirt and add digital content, right? And then take it to the next level. LinkedIn for sure. Um, imagining your ideal professional image, like we were working on the first workshop thing you did. What do I really want to be doing? How's that connected to language? And how can I highlight that online on my own web page where I'm building my professional presence? Okay. So we have a couple minutes where we could do Q&A, but I also want to make sure that you rem circle back and remember the networking that we were doing and that um, leave taking is so important. Last impressions are almost as important as first impressions. And employers say all the time, oh, the interview went great, but I thought he didn't want the job. Because when it was over, <laughs> he just like got up and dashed out of the room. You're so relieved it's over, you take off. You have to take your time, make sure you have questions ready when they say, do you have any questions for us? Again, smile, thank them for the interview, try to thank them for something specific that you enjoyed, shake their hand, and take leave appropriately. So we want to do that today and circle back to the networking and the first impressions with our last impressions because they are right in line behind first impressions. So before we do that, any questions for Q&A? As you leave, make sure you find, oh, sorry. I just have one. How would you um, work your language skills, make that apparent on the website if you make your own, if you make your own, uh, if, if you make your own website? Yeah. And well, and I think you, that's where you're curating your own professional digital content. So you want to be putting up exactly these kinds of examples we've been talking about. Here's a link to the Prezi slides I did in my German literature class, but that highlighted the public health issues there. People want to see that you're making those connections, and you need to put it out there. 